We love you. <laughs> I came into 2015, as you know, with a new beard, preaching about some new things in the Christian life. And um, the first one on the first Sunday of January, I, I talked about a new boldness. Because in the, in the book of Acts, man, it's just a pretty incredible story how God took these ordinary, uneducated men and he filled them with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God boldly. And that day we prayed as God's people in the 21st century for a new boldness. And then last week, <clears throat> I, I went to a passage uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 that you're familiar with. And we looked in the Old Testament and God picking out the next king for Israel said, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And that makes it great potential for everybody. Because you may not be the best looking or the best this or the best that, but God looks at the heart. And therefore, we all have this awesome potential in Christ, right? And it's not what school you graduated from or it's not how high you can jump or how far you can throw. I mean, that won't hurt you, you know. But it, it's, it's like who we are in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away and all oh, things have become new. And all of a sudden our eyes are open, you know, to, man, God wants me to go to South Korea, you know. I mean, it's like just a potential. And, and there's no ceiling. I mean, it's like all things are possible for you. And, and, and we looked at verses where it said, anyone that's had faith in me will do what I have been doing. If you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit, have much influence. And on a day where the disciples didn't feel like they could do the things that they needed to do, they came to Jesus and said, why could we not cast the demon out? And Jesus said, because your faith is so small. It wasn't because they didn't have strong enough arms. It wasn't because they didn't have enough education. It, it wasn't because they didn't have money in their bank account. It was because their faith was small. And he looked at him. He said, man, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, a mustard seed is small. He said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be moved from here to there, and it'll be done for you. And then he said, nothing will be impossible. Man, I mean, it's just like, oh, it's all in Christ. I love college educations, and I love athletics, and I, I love big bank accounts, you know, and I love big bank accounts that tithe to the church out of that bank, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, man, it's all about who we are in Jesus Christ. Look at the first verse we're looking at today. And, uh, well, let's look at the verse, then we'll go back in a minute and look at the picture. So if we could look at the verse, therefore, if anyone's in Christ, that's where all your potential is, right? It's, are you in Christ? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Or are you in Christ? And <clears throat> you're, you're a new creature. Those old things, man, they've passed away. All things have become new. <clears throat> and I was interested as I continued down that passage and we're not going to look at it right now, but 2 Corinthians 5, 18, the very next verse, 18, 19, 20, 21, talk about kind of a big word. It's the word reconciliation. And it's almost like it just follows. If we're in Christ, if we're new creatures in Christ, praying for a new boldness, realizing our new potential, there's a new ministry for us. And there's a new message for us. And it's the ministry and the message of reconciliation. Hatfields and McCoys. Now, some of the younger people look at me like, who is that? Now, do y'all, does anybody, did you see, there was a show about the Hatfields and McCoys. I Googled Hatfields and McCoys, and the mere mention, now this is what it says on the history.com, the mere mention of their name stirs up visions of a lawless and unrelenting family feud for years. They feuded. Devil, and this is his name, Devil Hatfield and Randall McCoy. Devil Hatfield, that's kind of interesting. Devil Hatfield and Randall McCoy, they were close friends and comrades in the Civil War. But their relationship started breaking down at the end of the Civil War 
and they returned to their neighboring homes, Hatfield in West Virginia, McCoy in Kentucky. Tensions, misunderstandings, and resentments mounted. Soon, it exploded into an all-out war between the two families. Friends, neighbors, outside forces joined the fight, bringing the two states, Kentucky to Tennessee, at the brink of a civil war. Because two friends, something came in between two friends, and it exploded. Reconciliation is the word. It's the ministry that you and I have. It's what we receive from God. It's the message that we have to speak to others. And I believe, man, if we'll get a hold of this issue that I'm going to talk about today, the world around us is going to be changing. Friendships. Things happen, don't they? And that person you were warm with or friends with now, you're estranged. Families fight for one another. Marriages end with this simple phrase. We are citing now irreconcilable what? Differences. Families, churches, cities. Now, I noticed in the latest uh, thing here, that uh, we've, uh, they've picked, whoever does this, picks the man of the year. And I read the article, Mayor Max, Sh- no, not Mac, um, help me, Junior Shelton. And uh, the first guy was Mac Watts and now it's Junior Shelton. And it, it says in here, after four years of controversy, and, and I'm not speaking to the accuracy of that, under this new man's, Mayorship, harmony, and unity. Something was reconciled, right? There was a reconciliation. And um, people groups. I mean, we're we're still, Jacob and Esau, we're, we're still working out that need for reconciliation. I mean, Jacob is the father of the Jews and Esau the father of the Muslims. And they're still... I mean, that's a lot worse than Hatfield and McCoy. So I, I want to speak today for the need of reconciliation. There, there's a, there's, first, there's going to be, we're going to look at the miracle of reconciliation. God in Christ reconciled us. That's the miracle. And then I want to talk to you about the ministry of reconciliation. Because once we've been reconciled, he puts us in a ministry. It's the ministry of reconciliation. And then he gives us a new message, the message of reconciliation. Be reconciled to God is the message of reconciliation. And then this might sound a little funny, but I want to show you in the last verse, verse 21, the muscle and the meat behind reconciliation. It's, it, it, it's kind of interesting. You know, sometimes we just need to overlook differences. Sometimes we need to forgive offenses. Sometimes we just need to bear with one another, right? I mean, there's no need for reconciliation there. I mean, man, I can forgive some things you do, and I can overlook some things that you can do, and I can bear with the bear in you, right? And you can bear with the bear in me. But sometimes the difficulties in relationships are so fierce, sometimes they're so deep that you got to deal with what's in between the two parties before the two parties can come together. Right? I mean, sometimes you can just, hey, I love you, you love me, I forgive you. But sometimes there's something in between the two parties that make reconciliation impossible unless that's taken care of. This is the miracle of reconciliation. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 18. All this is from God reconciled us to himself through Christ. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. God in Christ took the initiative and he reconciled you and I to us. Well, here's one party, God. Here's another party, Jesus. No, I'm sorry, us. What was that thing that was between us that had to be miraculously, deeply, Once and for all, 
taken care of so that we could have a relationship with God, right? What was between us? Sin. In the garden, the man was walking with God, talking with God, fellowship with God. There was no reconciliation uh, needed, but Eve looked at the apple, took the apple, Adam ate the apple, sin entered the world, and all of a sudden we're sitting there with two parties, a holy, sinless God and a man who was prone to sin, prone to pride, prone to wanting to do it himself, prone to wanting to ignore God. Something had to be done forgiveness or overlooking or bearing with none of that would work in this situation there was a holy god there was a sinful man there was sin in between until that sin was taken care of god could not relate to man man could not relate to god we were thrown out into this world totally on our own without god the miracle of reconciliation is that God reconciles us to himself through Christ. God reconciles us to himself through Christ. He took care of what was in between us. Until Jesus entered the picture, it was God in us and no reconciliation had taken place. A holy God, a sinful man, there was no mixing, there was no meeting, there was no matching up, man. We didn't have a chance. Holy God, sinful man. But God sent his son, Jesus. The miracle of reconciliation is that God reconciled us to himself through Christ. Enemies became friends. Issues between man and God were resolved. Tensions and misunderstandings were dealt with. Resentment was put away. The miracle of reconciliation. God in Christ reconciling you and I to him. From the miracle to the mundane for just a second. Reconciliation as you know, as I've already said, I grew a beard, and it kind of like came between Jackie and I. My, I think it was my grandmother, but somewhere I saw this, cooking don't laugh, no, kissing don't laugh, but cooking do. And man, I've always said, no, I want kissing to last. <laughs> Anybody with me? Well, so for 66 years, man, I've had a clean face. And then I, you know, it's like, oh, man, God, illustrations. And and I have kind of gotten some mileage out of this beard, I have to confess, at least from the pulpit. And, boy, as it got a little bit longer, and I, I, is it okay if, is this PG-13 or is this R? I still kiss my wife. You you rate it, and I like it, and and I want you to know, man. That so then the beard came, and you know it's like mm, you know I kissed my wife, and it was just didn't work very well, and and she go mm, you know and spit. I mean it would do that. So I mean I I thought well maybe see if I can reconcile this thing. I need to do something with the beard. So Caleb gave me his peanut. A peanut, it didn't give it to me. Now, that's an interesting thing. He lent me his peanut. And a peanut does not shave the beard. It trims the beard. At least that's my understanding. Because it has this thing on it, you know. And so I, I, uh, wanting kissing to last, not just cooking. She's a great cook too, but I want kissing and cooking. Oh, boy. How many of you would like that? Come on. Now, look at all these guys. Oh, just cooking will do. No, just kicking will So I I plug this in, man, you know, Jackie, (laughs) you know, I'm not going to finish the story. It didn't, it didn't seem to help that much, you know, 
Now, there's only one thing that's going to reconcile Jackie and Dick but by the, this thing that's in between us, this beard. It's a clean shave, amen? And on January 31st, this is my intention, is that I'm going to get a clean shave and be reconciled to my wife again, amen? <laughs> the miracle of reconciliation is that God in Christ reconciled us. He took care of the beard so to speak or he took care of the sin he took care of that that was in between us and we are here today because he made a way he gave us access he took care of our sin and now the two parties are reconciled amen amen now let's look at the ministry of reconciliation it starts here in this verse and then what did he do? He reconciled us to himself through Christ. But look at that next phrase. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Man, I struggle with this. I said, well, a little bit later, we're going to look at the message of reconciliation. It's in these verses. I said, God, what's the difference between the ministry of reconciliation and the message of reconciliation? And I, I, I promise you, I, I did not know the answer to that question when I woke up that morning, yesterday morning. And I told Jackie that, and we spent some time together. And, and this is my conclusion, the ministry of reconciliation. God loved us, and because we've received the love of God, we can love one another. Amen? You buy that? God forgave us, and we're commanded because we've received the forgiveness of God to forgive those around us. Now, just add this to that. God reconciled us he took away that thing that was in between us and him so that we could have relationship to him and i believe the ministry of reconciliation is the ministry that he gives us once we've experienced the miracle of, re of reconciliation he gives us the ministry of reconciliation and the ministry of reconciliation is as he entered our world we then reconciled to god in our our world and we become ministers of reconciliation in other words we decide that we're going to do whatever it takes so that i can have good relationship with the people around me right the ministry of reconciliation now, God was not guaranteed that once he did this incredible act of reconciliation, he gave his son, he was not guaranteed that we would respond, but he did his part. When we become ministers of, of reconciliation, when we enter the ministry, of, we're not guaranteed that that person's going to respond, but our job is to enter into that ministry, believing in faith that God has reconciled us through Christ and he's given us the ministry of reconciliation, and that it's our job to do whatever it takes to make sure we're right standing with those around us. Is that a good explanation of the ministry of reconciliation? If you've got a busted relationship out there, I'm telling you it's your responsibility to take the initiative to go out there and be a minister of reconciliation. We can no longer wait. We can no longer say, well, he did this or she did that. We take the initiative as ministers of recreation. No, reconciliation. God came into our world. Jesus came into our world. He initiated the reconciliation thing. And I really believe that God showed me that we become ministers of reconciliation. We go into our world. Now, I'm going to get personal. For me. <laughs> in 19, uh, let's say, 88, 9, Jackie and I met Steve and Chris. And Steve and Chris were ministers at um, Shady Grove Church. And we loved them. And they loved us. And uh, in 1993, when I came down here to, to, to um, Cornerstone, it wasn't too, too long after I invited Steve to come down. And in, in the 1995, 96, 97, he was very instrumental in child training seminars and speaking into the life of our church and, and basically instrumental in just becoming our friend. I mean, it's like everybody kind of fell in love with Steve Adel. 
And um, man, uh, when his wife contracted cancer and and uh, eventually died, the church bought an airplane ticket for Jackie and I to fly up to New York, where they were at that point. And we visited with them two months before Chris died, went to be with heaven, and just had great fellowship. And then we have lived with Steve as a church through this conversion from to, to a widower. And he's come down here and he's said, man, you guys love your wives, you know? I mean, it's like, I wish I'd love, you know, we just had that kind of experience with him. And I, all the details are not as significant, but I, this is the truth. And this is what I had to deal with yesterday. And I, I need your prayers. I'm broken. Do I, I mean, I don't know what I look like up here Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, but I'm in need of prayer and I'm in need of grace. And when I look at the Word of God, I don't want to look at it and hear it and understand it and then just go away and forget it. So, man, I'm saying, God, what's the ministry of reconciliation? What's the ministry of reconciliation? Well, two and a half years ago, Steve came down and he had a seminar and we got recordings Clayton, uh, Todd Clayton's out with cameras and all that stuff. And he was here four or five days. And every time he'd come down, he'd stay at our house. I mean, it was that kind of relationship. Two and a half years ago, I took Steve to the airport. And he got out of my car. And he got on the airplane. And he flew back up to New York. And we have not talked since. And the job for me today is not to tell you what happened. I'm not sure I even know what happened. And many of you who know Steve and know the relationship that we had with Steve are going, gee, not here and here. But I'm telling you, for two and a half years, I haven't talked to my brother Steve. And he hasn't talked to me. I mean, it's like, and I, I, Jackie said even yesterday, she said, you know, but I don't, I still don't understand what happened. But two friends, man. Two friends, something came in. And I, 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 I'm not clueless about it. But in response to the word of God, I had no choice but to call him yesterday. And he was at work. He took a message, and then he called me back, and I couldn't answer, so he left the message. And we're going to talk to each other for the first time in two and a half years today after three o'clock. Reconciliation. You know, I just really came to the conclusion that I I don't want to meet the Lord without reconciling between my brother. I I really don't even know what to say. I I don't know. Here's Steve and here's Dick and here's this thing that developed. I, I don't know exactly what it was and I don't know exactly how to handle it once we find out what it was but it's more than just oh i forgive you you forgive me you understand what i'm saying it's more than oh you're just different than me and i'm different than you and we can bear with one another no there's something that needs to be dealt with and i say that so that you'll pray for me but i also say that to give you the hope of the miracle of reconciliation in some relationships that you're in right now it may be a spouse It may be a child. It it may be at work. It may be a best friend you used to walk with in close harmony. But you cannot, this, this is what I felt. I cannot receive the miracle of reconciliation in my life where God went to extreme measures. He sent his son. He reconciled me through Christ. He, he did that for me. And then I can sit here and have people in my life, in my world, that I have not taken the initiative to reconcile the relationship with? Does, I, that's too many words. Did you understand what I said? How dare I, how dare you, receive the reconciliation miracle <laughs> that God pours out upon you and then have messed up relationships around you? And I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not guaranteed that Steve is going to, you know, do anything. And, and you're not guaranteed that if you take the initiative and be a minister of reconciliation, that that person you're reaching out to, there's no, there's no, that's not the issue. The issue is not, does reconciliation take place? The issue is, did you, by the grace of God, take the initiative to reach out as a minister of reconciliation and love that person in Jesus' name and leave the results to the person? 
And this is heavy. This is deep. I wasn't at, at Cornerstone for a, a, a couple of months before I realized that Cornerstone was started by a 75 people that left Zor Baptist Church. And, and they, they started a church in a, in a home, and, and that was in 1983. You know, here we are 30 years later. And I'd been here, and we talked to the deacons and the elders at that time, and, and we just decided that, man, maybe we need to go back to Zor the pastor at that time was not Kevin Hand. It was, um, what's the guy before him? Carol Moore. And so we went to Carol Moore and we said, hey, we're not saying there's anything between the two churches, but just in case. And we went through a process. He submitted it to the deacons. The deacons read a, wrote a letter and, uh, um, uh, and, and, and gave it to us and said, man, we're here. Nothing's between us. We acknowledge that you're a church and we're a church and we're going to work together to reach people for Jesus Christ. In other words, I don't know if there was something that needed to be reconciled or not, but now I know there's nothing that needs to be reconciled between us and Zor. And that opened the door for Lauren of Cornerstone to go marry Josh, the son of Kevin Hand. I take credit for anything I can take credit for. Reconciliation can lead to amazing things. And I say, I forget I said that. I, I'm not trying to be funny. Listen, man, I'm telling you, if you'll commit your life to the ministry of reconciliation because you've experienced the miracle of reconciliation, I'm telling you some things are going to start happening. I'm telling you some things are going to start happening. Well, the ministry of reconciliation, and then we've got the message of reconciliation. Now, let me just say this. It's not only you can be the minister of reconciliation to those in your world to reconcile between your relationship between you and them, but then you might have an opportunity to be a minister of reconciliation in another way. You see some friends who are having a marriage difficulty, or you see two friends that are you know, arguing something. You can go out and help them, right? Reconcile in their relationship. So first, as a reconciled member of the body of Christ, you start taking the initiative to reconcile with the people around you, and then God opens the door, right? God opens the door for you to be a minister of reconciliation and help others reconcile to themselves. And the first thing you do with others is you speak to them the message of reconciliation. And let me show you the message of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. All right, so there's the miracle of reconciliation. God reconciled us by Christ. There's the ministry of reconciliation. We need to take the initiative to reconcile with others. And then there's the message of reconciliation. Now, what's the message of reconciliation? Well, let's keep on going. He's committed to us the message of reconciliation. He's committed to us the message of reconciliation. So not only do I have the ministry of reconciliation, I have the message of reconciliation. And it says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. What? What's the message of reconciliation that we have for the world? Be reconciled to God, right? That is the message of reconciliation. In other words, be saved. Now, this is the new miracle that we're looking at. It's the new ministry that I think that God has for us. And, and it's the new message. I mean, it's, it's not like a new message, but it, it's just to realize that we've received the miracle of reconciliation. We become ministers of reconciliation, and we have a message of reconciliation. He is committed to us. He has given to every Christian a message of reconciliation. And look what it says. It says, therefore, we become ambassadors of Christ. Well, what's an ambassador? An ambassador is one who lives in a foreign country and speaks the message of the country he comes from that the president or the CEO or the sovereign <laughs> gives him. In other words, an ambassador is somebody who lives in the United States or was raised in the United States and is sent to a foreign country with the message of the president of that country. Gosh, we're ambassadors of Christ. How many of you know that our real citizenship is where? In heaven. 
And we're aliens and strangers in this world, it says in 1 Peter. So we really are um, citizens of a foreign country, and we've been given a message from our sovereign God, amen? And we're living in this alien and stranger place. We're not members of this world. Our citizenship is in heaven. And the Bible says we're eagerly awaiting a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're living here in this world as aliens and strangers with the message of reconciliation. Speaking to those all around us, be reconciled to God. And look how Paul says it. He says, we implore you. I'm I'm an ambassador of Christ. I've been sent with a message. And we implore you, we beg you, be reconciled to God. See, God did his part, right? What's our part? It's to receive that reconciliation. It's to put our faith and trust in God. It's to believe in Jesus Christ. And once we believe in what God did, then, praise God, reconciliation has taken place. So we implore people to be reconciled. We implore people to understand that God made him who had no... I'm not going to get to that yet. That's the final verse. But so, so understand that just that everybody doesn't get saved, God made it available for everybody he chooses to get saved. But does everybody get saved? Their response is to be reconciled. God's not guaranteed that anybody would, but he did his part. You're not guaranteed that anybody will, but do your part. I made the call. Do it. This is it, man. Man, we hadn't talked for a long time. I don't know what I'm going to say this afternoon, but I want to do my part. And I want to go to all those people in my world in some form or fashion. And I want to say, you know, I I don't want to do this because we don't want to be pushy. We don't want to be uh, obnoxious. I mean, we know people that are that way. But but with this in our hearts, we implore you on Christ's behalf. Please get some urgency in your heart. Did you see Jerry Campbell? First she told us she can't preach. And then she preached. And there was something that came up in her. Oh, God, give me that passion. Give me that passion, the passion of Billy Graham, the passion of the great pastors and preachers of of the past that would would speak with with this, this urgency. I implore you, I beg you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And the meat and the muscle behind that message is in verse 21. For it says, God, here's the meat, here's the, here's the muscle, here's the, here's the Austin McGraw behind the ministry of reconciliation. Here's the Austin McGraw behind the miracle of reconciliation. Here's the Austin McGraw behind the message of reconciliation. It's in verse 21. Look at it. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I mean, that's so over the top. God, was there another way you sent your son to die on the cross? Wasn't there another way to get that sin out from between our relationship? God knew there was no other way. God, from the very beginning, the very creation of the world, had a plan in place. It was a plan for reconciliation. It was a plan for redemption. It was a plan to retrieve his lost children that had gone astray through sin and through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The high priest who has gone into the heavenlies through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. God made him who had no sin. God made him who had no sin. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, for you. God made him who had no sin. I mean, this is not a light dealing. This is not, oh, I forgive you. Oh, I bear with you. Oh, I can put up with you. Man, 
God did the whole thing big time. He did what it took. He said once and for all, man, I'm going to reconcile God to my to, to the men to me. He did whatever it took. It was over the top. It was unbelievable what he did. It was astonishing what he did. It was jaw-dropping what God did. It was amazing what he did. It was astounding what he did. It was eye-opening what he did. It was flabbergasting what he did. God made him to be sin for you. So that in him, you might become the righteous. That's not enough words to describe it. It was jolting what he did, shocking what he did, startling what he did, stunning what he did, surprising what he did. And the world's not accepting what he did. You know, if anyone could have been worked out his own reconciliation, and I close with this illustration. If, if anybody could have worked out their own illustration, how, how many of you have seen Unbroken? Uh, I mean, Louis Zamberini, I, I think he was an Olympic runner. He spent 47 days on a raft after his plane was shot down in the ocean. He survived unspeakable tortures, dehumanization, and beating. And he returned, I'm just encapsulating a long life story into this few seconds. He returned to the United States as a hero. He returned to the United States, ticker tape parades, marriage to a beautiful young lady, speaking engagements, financial opportunities. But he also returned to the United States, nightmares, anger, and mental explosions from the two or three years that he had been a prisoner of war in Japan. Only alcohol could calm his nerves. Divorce proceedings had been started by his wife who had finally given up. One image dominated Louis's life. It was the image of Bird. Bird was the Japanese officer that expressed and instigated such incredible cruelty against Louis personally and all the prisoners of war. Louis's life became fueled by a desire to kill the boy. Now this is not all in the film. It's all in this book. Wonderful book. So he's an alcoholic. Gets up every day fueled by the fire, fueled by the anger, desire to kill the bird. His life was disintegrating. The marriage was disintegrating. There was so much in between he and his wife and he and the world. Nobody could take care of that. But some friends down the hall, ministers of reconciliation perhaps, had received the reconciliation of the Lord Jesus Christ into their lives, and they invited Louis and his wife to the Billy Graham conference in Los Angeles in 1953. Louis would have nothing to do with it. His wife went. And the night after she went, the first time, she came back and she said, Louis, I'm not divorcing you. She canceled all the divorce proceedings. You know, when reconciliation takes place between man and God, then we start reconciling with people. She canceled the divorce proceedings and she pleaded with Louis to go to the Billy Graham conference in Los Angeles. And he resisted and resisted and resisted. And he said, man, I can, I can hold out until he leaves, you know. But he finally went. There were some things that happened and he finally went and he showed up and he heard a message on redemption and reconciliation and Jesus and all that. And he resisted it all, and he left, and he spent the night that night dreaming of the bird, nightmares. Not one night had passed since he had returned home that he did not have nightmares of the bird. He went back a second time and a third time, and on the third time, he was ready to get out. He was going to bolt. He went back under these conditions. He said, sweetheart, I I I'll go back, but when he starts playing just as I am and invites us to come down and make a decision, I'm out of there. 
And he started making this invitation, and the music started playing, and Louis Zamberini got up out of his seat to take off, go that direction. And God brought to his mind right then that in the wrath on the 37th day, he had prayed a prayer, the only prayer of his whole life, to God. And he said, God, if you get me out of this, I will serve you for the rest of my life. And as he was going down the aisle, turning to go out, God brought that to his heart. He turned back around, went down, got saved. It's all in the book. That night, he went home, got rid of all his alcohol, poured it down the sink got rid of all his pornography, and that was the first night in five years that he did not have a nightmare. A miracle of reconciliation. Amen. Only God. A ministry of reconciliation. Within a few years, he was given the opportunity to go and sit down with 850 war criminals the very men that had perpetrated all these things upon them. And I, uh, the book tells how he, he extended a hand of reconciliation to these 850 men. And then finally, <coughs> the message of reconciliation, he wrote a message to the bird and uh, he basically said, man, listen, I found new life in Jesus Christ, and I would hope for you that you would become a Christian. In other words, I implore you on Christ's behalf to reconcile to God. The message of reconciliation. Man. Billy. Billy, just stand with me, would you do that? Lord Jesus, come today. Touch our hearts today. <clears throat> Father, I, I, if, if I could just, before I pray, and then I won't extend an invitation, but I, I would just not want you to come here and hear me open my heart to you and, and, and be, be touched, perhaps, be moved a little bit, kind of have some thoughts going through your mind. This is what I don't want to have happen. Then I don't want you to leave and forget what you've heard. I believe Satan is there to rip it out of your heart so you won't pursue this thought. I believe the cares and the worries of this world will keep you too busy where you won't pursue this thought. I think your desires for other things will make you forget what I've spoken to you today. But there are some. <laughs> This is the parable of the sower. There are some who are going to hear this message of reconciliation. You're going to thank God for the miracle of reconciliation for you. You're going to become a minister of reconciliation with the message of reconciliation. And it's all going to be undergirded by this incredible thing that God has done. Who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In Him, we might have access to God the Father. Father, pour out Your Spirit on these precious people. Pour out Your Spirit. Lord, let us be a church that has experienced the miracle and is engaging in the ministry and the message, Father God. Thank You. Thank You. First off, Lord, I just want to say thank You for reconciling me to Yourself through Christ. <laughs> Would You just tell Him that? Would You thank God that He saved You? <clears throat> that he made Jesus Christ to be sin, somebody who had no sin to be sin for you, that you might become the righteousness of God. Would you thank God that you've experienced the miracle of reconciliation? And I may just uh, pause here for a minute. Perhaps you're sitting here saying, man, I haven't experienced that. I'm not made right with God. I've not accepted what Jesus Christ did on the cross for me. I had never heard this message before today. Just as Louis Zamberini walked down the aisle and accepted Christ, threw away alcohol, got rid of pornography, never had another nightmare again, today might be that day where you experience the miracle of reconciliation. Okay? 
just come down here and say, I've never been saved. I want to experience the miracle, the reconciliation. I know there's something keeping me from God. And I hadn't known what it was until today. And now I know it's sin. I need forgiveness of sin. And, and you can experience that, that, that miracle, the miracle of, resurrect, of reconciliation. And then secondly, I just want to, want, to, want to say, man, don't hesitate to jump in to the ministry. I mean, Jerry, Jerry Campbell is like, Come on, man. There's some of you guys been called to be in the choir. I'm telling you, all of you have been called into the ministry of reconciliation. I could go as far as this to say, how dare you receive the miracle of reconciliation and then not be quick to enter in, jump in, grab hold of the ministry of reconciliation with the message of reconciliation. Lord, come and touch our hearts. We thank you, Father. We come just as we are without one plea, Lord Jesus. You just We surrender to you. We surrender to your plan for our lives. You know, there might be some out there that want to be doctors or, or chiefs or, you know, uh, welders or, or, you know, a thousand different plans in your heart. And those are all good. Do that. But on top of that, undergirding all of those plans, God's will for your life is that you jump into the ministry of reconciliation. Without hesitation, you jump into the ministry of reconciliation. You're not guaranteed the person is going to respond. Your job is to do your part, just like God did his part. Father, come and touch us. Come on, just raise your hands to the Lord as we close with a song. Lord Jesus, we, uh, we humble ourselves under your mighty hand. And once again, even as we've already done in worship, we surrender to you. We surrender to the ministry. Amen. <laughs> We're called into the ministry, the ministry of reconciliation with the message of reconciliation. And we're excited that we're going to see miracles of reconciliation. Father, I thank you for that husband and wife who need to be reconciled. I pray, God, that it'll happen soon. I pray for that family, the, hud, the father, the mother that needs to be reconciled. I pray for that good friend. I pray for Steve and I, Lord. We had such sweet fellowship. I pray, Father, that Steve and I could be reconciled, not just for my sake, Lord, but for the sake of the body of Christ here at Cornerstone. He's our brother. What happened, Lord? What happened? Father, I pray right now that we would receive the power of God to go into our world doing our part to make sure we're reconciled in Jesus' name. Now, I want to say one other thing to you. Jackie and I had a couple of hours talking about this yesterday. I had a couple of hours in my quiet time with the Lord. God, I'm going to be in front of the people today, and Lord, I want to have an accurate representation of the Bible, and I don't know the difference between the ministry of reconciliation and the message of reconciliation. And man, I, I guess I could say with, with Austin, man, I was, I was kind of like in the Lord, jacked up. I mean, I was encouraged. I spent the time with my wife. And at one point in time, in that, I, I went over to my wife and I bowed in front of her chair and she was sitting there. And I said, God, Jackie, would you forgive me? Because I let pride so often get in between my relationship with you. Look at this. Here's Dick, the husband. Here's Jackie, the wife. And here's pride. How many of you just slip your hand up in the air and say, man, pride all the time gets in the way between my wife and I. And I ask her forgiveness. And I'm crying out that God's going to allow me to deal with the pride in my heart that breaks that relationship between me and my beloved wife. But this is what I, what I, what I, I, I want to make sure you know. Right now, I think that probably God, by His grace, is encouraging you to, to do this, to make that step, to make that telephone call, to take that first step toward that person, right? And I'm telling you, the hardest digit I've ever dialed on my cell phone was yesterday at 3 o'clock, dialing Steve's number. In other words, everything I had felt that morning, everything that God was encouraging me to do, it comes down to this. first step. Second digit was easy. Third was better. By the fourth, man, I said, thank you, Lord. But I'm taking that step. I just want to encourage you. What you hear 
in the light, in the middle of praise and worship with the soft music playing. What you hear, what that commitment you make in your heart, it's, it's not going to be as easy to fulfill out there. Just take that first step. Second step will be easy. <laughs> Third step, kind of thought so. Lord, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hey, you come. I'd be glad to pray for you. Elders and deacons and wives, if we need you guys, just come on down and pray as we close our service. Before uh, we pray, I just want to share uh, one thing. Just thank God for a pastor who just shares where he's at. Amen. And uh, and that's so true. And, uh, and I'll say thank God for a pastor. And I want to say thank God for, for wise elders. Because as many as you know, my, my grandfather on my dad's side passed away last week. And, um, and he's been hanging on for about two months, um, hardly eating. And, uh, and so we were in an elders meeting, and I was sharing that. And Brother Bill said, listen, um, have you talked to him with his relationship with Jesus? And I said, it seems like it would be good. And he's like, is there anything in his life with another person, either something he needs to ask forgiveness for or something he needs to forgive? Because sometimes people hang on to those kind of things. And uh, I don't know. He says, if you have an opportunity, talk to him. And two Wednesday nights ago, we got a call that he wasn't doing well at all. And um, after church, I uh, went and sat down, and he was mostly non-responsive. <laughs> but he made eye contact with me, and, and I shared. And he couldn't respond back other than the fact that there was eye contact. And, and I, whether it's something I saw, whether it was the Holy Spirit, he shook his head and said, hey, um, I hear you. I just shared with Papa. Listen you have that relationship with Jesus. He's forgiven you. Now, if you need to ask forgiveness from somebody, do it. He will hear, you know, if you need to forgive somebody, let it go. And, and it felt like a, a good moment. And, um, and then we prayed and, and, uh, went home that evening and he passed away six o'clock the next morning. But man, if he was hanging on to something, man, we can hang on to offenses and we can hang on to stuff and it's terrible. And, and just like my pastor said, that first digit to call or that first step to take is so hard, but that, that's why we're here. And this time at the end of our service is not something that church is almost out time. It's, hey, let's do business with God. Let's go up, pray with elders, deacons, people who love us, care for us, and God can do something. I mean, if you don't choose to come up, let's pray at our seats and, uh, and just take a few minutes. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the word that was brought forth. I thank you for an honest pastor. God, who shares where he's at, what he's going through. Lord, we receive that. We see that humility, God, and we acknowledge that that is a great leadership, God. Lord, we thank you that you have forgiven us, that you have reconciled our sin through your son, Jesus Christ, God. If, if, we, if some of us need to forgive today, God, remind us again of what we've been forgiven and bring us to humility, Father, so that we will take our first step, God. God, we don't want to hang on to anything and, and, and be bitter or whatever in this life, Father, God. We want to just give it up, give it to you, Father, in Jesus' name.